Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to our uh, our behind the scenes mini Casual Friday. I'm Holly Fry and I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And this week we talked about someone who designed some of my favorite places on the planet, Andre Le Nôtre. Yeah, you have been. I mean, we said this in the episode, but you mentioned that you were working on this as soon as we got back from Paris, <laughs> and for the first for the first several uh, weeks after that, I would get your outline and it would be something else. And at first, I was like, "What happened to Le Nôtre? And then I was like, "She'll she'll get through it. It's gonna happen someday." Well, I kept ordering books. And, like, (laughs) it's one of those things that, because he did so much, one, it's hard to, like, really figure out what you have to include and what you can cut for time. Like, we talked a lot about his work, and we didn't cover so many things that he did that I'm sure other people are like, why did you not talk about this? It's my favorite. Because he was so prolific. Uh, And also just, like, In some ways, it felt very self-indulgent because it is a a two-parter about something that I love so much and that is so much about aesthetics and beauty. And we only briefly touched on, like, the the moral implications of France spending that much money to create, uh, in particular, like, the gardens that he created for the crown and also, like, the cost of human lives that were involved in in works like this. Yeah. So, because that opens up, like, a whole other, I mean, that becomes a whole other show on its own, talking about, like, why Louis XIV was so willing to spend so lavishly. And to us, it often, I think, looks very, very um, irresponsible. But to him, he had it in his mind. I'm not saying this is correct. But Louis XIV's perspective was that, one, he really did have a conscious decision at one point to make France exactly what it has come to be known as today, which is, like, where design and style come from. Like, the absolute top-tier design and aesthetics would all be part of French cultural identity. And so he was, in uh, from one end, like, really, really um, promoting that idea. Like, he wanted textiles to be... Um, the best textiles to come from France. He wanted the best architects to come from France. He wanted the best painters to come from France. Like, that was part of it. But another thing was that his ideology, and again, this is a little divorced from reality, was that for France to be prosperous, France had to look prosperous. Um, That's kind of a very simplified version, but, like, he felt like, you know, if he had visiting dignitaries, they had to see the most lush, beautiful stylish, expensive, everything, so that they could appreciate not only that France had style, but that France was secure enough to be able to afford such things. And so that would make them willing to work with France, and therefore that would, um, you know, propagate more wealth and income. There are big questions about the security of France, and, like, Louis XIV really loved to wage war, and whether or not (laughs) he he was also, uh, you know, kind of just doing all of this as an ego thing, uh, all things that get debated forever. But it is interesting. I mean, we it is the precursor of what leads up to the mess of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. And, like, at that point, they are so divorced from the common man and how badly some people are living while they literally just, like, are have everything done for them and, and have the best of everything. That it's, I mean, that's part of my fascination with 17th through 19th century France is like watching that transition of the ideology I think is interesting. I don't think it's sound, but it's interesting oh, sure, <laughs> of like, sure. we have to look amazing. You know, it's kind of like fake it till you make it on an epic and very expensive scale. Yeah. And then how that gets to the point where the faking it part becomes everything and there's no actual substance behind it. And you're broke is a joke. Well, and it also reminds me of how in a much, much more reduced scale, Uh, When our offices moved from a part of Atlanta that was mostly like a financial district with hotels and businesses and things like that into like a more quirky space with an old building that was being like revitalized into this multi-use space, there was this whole argument about uh, like what people's perception of our 
uh, our work was depending on whether we were surrounded by a bunch of bankers or whether we were surrounded by like this new newly redone a multi-use building with a lot more variety in it. It's like the the weirdness of optics of what your place is and how people see you because of that place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it it, <laughs> it is the kind of thing that people think about uh, or that they don't always think about. Like there are subconscious judgments that we make all the time based on how we see someone spending money, living their life, et cetera. Absolutely. Yeah. We're not, I mean, we're so unconscious of it. It's one of those things I I try to be actively conscious and go, wait, wait, wait. I can't presume this person is X, Y, or Z because they are like – that this person is smart because they're wearing a Richard Tyler suit because maybe they're just an idiot who inherited money. I don't know. Or maybe they are really smart and they're self-made and, that you know, you can't make those judgments. But we're doing it all the time. Right. Subconsciously. Um, yeah, it becomes a very weird thing. There's also that thing uh, for me – I mean, I, I love – the visual arts, obviously, I talk about it on the show all the time. I always want to talk about painters and sculptors and and people who design things. But there is that weird moment where kind of just what I was talking about before, where the artifice becomes the identity of someone and like this sort of artificial life that they've put together starts to be like they believe their own hype of it. Mm-hmm. And then they're in a very dangerous place with Like, they're on the marshes with no solid footing. (laughs) Like, they do not have Linotra to build a solid foundation under them. Uh, Yeah, I mean, but the flip, too, right, is that for me, I'm sure it's not the same for everyone, but for me, and I know for other people that I have talked to, like, when you are in some of these spaces that Linotra created at great expense, it is moving in a way that is hard to quantify or describe. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, admittedly, like, I, because I love this era of French history and I love art, like, when we walked to the side of Versailles and we saw the Orangerie, I just started bawling. Like, it's so beautiful that it's very moving. Yeah, if I had it to do over, I could have spent all the time that we were in Versailles just in the gardens. Me too. I mean, part of that is we had the the sort of weird good fortune of it being a drizzly day when we got there. And so we did the gardens first and no one was out there because of the rain. And it wasn't heavy rain, but it was no, enough got, that, that people were worried it would get worse. Yeah. And so they stayed out of the gardens. Yeah, we just got sprinkled on a couple times. Yeah. Uh, and then inside, when you visit Versailles, it is not like a soothing leisurely experience. No. You are hustled through rooms and there are thousands of people with you at every second. Yeah. I so was, it's not an intimate feeling. No. <laughs> I, I had heard that it was very crowded and I was not prepared for the fact that like you're really shoulder to shoulder with the people around you shuffling through like the cattle shoot style. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's part of it, right? Like, in the gardens, you have a little more freedom to move about and experience it on your own time, in your own way, and it's not that, like, all right, next grove! Like, there's none (laughs) of that going on. Uh, So you can kind of stumble into these groves and be like, what have I found? And there's a little bit more of that sense of, of exploration and discovery that makes them magic in a whole different way. Even though, like, whoo, I could look at all that sculpture and painting in the the uh, palace forever, but you don't get the luxury experience, what feels very luxurious, of just being able to do it on your own time. Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's also fascinating, because I remember at one point I saw you and Patrick take off down the Grand Canal, like, mm-hmm. or down the, the um, that promenade, and, like, in seconds it looked like you were three miles away. Yeah. Like, it was yeah. a very... Talking about his use of perspective, I think, uh, can never do it justice to when you see it. And I'm like, I mean, you and Patrick walk quickly, but I was like, they did not cover three miles in like 90 (laughs) seconds. Definitely But it looks like you're in another country practically. Yeah, yeah. Um, And when you go into those little groves, it really is like you have wandered into a totally separate place that is isolated from the rest of the guard. Like you you can feel like you have just wandered into like a secluded thing Yeah, they feel very private. Yeah, a little part of this big, big garden. Yeah, it was very, very fun. Uh, That happened about halfway through our trip. 
Uh, and I remember there were a few times that, like, I got to know other people in our big group better because they would, like, pop out from a path and be like, you got to come over here. And, like, <laughs> they wanted to show me a grove that they had found that was, you know, like a spectacular fountain with mm-hmm. music. We didn't even talk about the music of Versailles because now when you go, there is is music piped into all of these groves. Those were always intended to be musical. It was just that when Louis the Fourteenth would go visit them and subsequent monarchs, uh, they would have musicians playing live to go with the fountains instead of the piped-in music that we hear today. That's a whole other level of, like, sense engagement that happens at Versailles that is difficult to explain, like, what that kind of does. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so it's yeah. like such a delight and a, a beautiful thing. And you sort of feel like a child in that you're experiencing something that is simple but beautiful. It's water flying through the air to music. And yet it just brings such joy. It's a it's a fascinating thing. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's, these, these are the things we think of when I debate the value of all of the expense of creating such a lavish and self-indulgent thing. But also, holy Moses, we have some art that is indescribably beautiful as a consequence. Yeah. Um, I also imagine that based on what we know of our listeners, we very frequently, after we've done an episode on something, get requests about uh, another similar thing. So I'm imagining we will hear from folks asking us to talk about Lancelot Capability Brown, who designed English landscape gardens, which are very, very different from the formal French gardens. So yes. uh, if folks are getting the the, the keyboard ready... <laughs> uh, he's actually been on my list for a while, thanks to um, our coworker Christopher, who who pitched him to us uh, some years ago. Now I feel like, yeah, there is also a whole interesting thing. If you look at um, Marie Antoinette's era, she had a portion of the grounds of Versailles changed completely over from that very formal French garden to like a little hamlet that was much more natural and did not have all of the manicuring Mm -hmm. and stuff. And that's a a whole other thing to be discussed. Like, again, the artifice of like, I'm going to make a fake farm and (laughs) I will feel like a farmer, but it's kind of like the equivalent of, you know, an amusement park because she's not really farming. Mm-hmm. She just wanted to wear a pretty dress and read Rousseau and talk about engaging with the natural world. Um, and we didn't even get into the Trianons, uh, the Grand Trianon, which was Louis XIV's kind of getaway from the palace at at Versailles. And then Petit Trianon, which was originally built for Madame de Pompadour and then later was given to Marie Antoinette by her husband and is a smaller getaway there on the grounds. There is a lot going on at Versailles. <laughs> um, and the gardens are all very beautiful at all of them. Uh, I highly recommend it if someone has the opportunity to go take it. Uh, I, it's one of those things I want to go back to. Uh, I loved our, our tour group and I thought that was an amazing experience, but I would love to go just by myself with no no itinerary and literally I think I could wander those gardens for eight hours straight. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and there's a little cafe in there now so you can you can be fed while you wander for eight hours straight. Uh, anyway, thank you for everyone for listening to my self-indulgent two-parter on Andre Lenoff. <laughs> Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs> 